as I said. Bill, do you, do you see... Bill, speak louder, so I don't... Um, sorry, is, do you, is, is there a, a term, like one of the comments on the problems with the nonprofits that you mentioned earlier was kind of the tenure of the executive director. Is it is it executive director and boards that, that need to be fresh and you know, should there be kind of a term limit on board membership? Or? Well, the, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, we talk a lot about board term limits and I'm sure we'll we'll get into it here. And the, the, again, the common wisdom in the nonprofit world today is uh, board members should serve a maximum of six years and then rotate off for a year and then they can come back on the board. That's not to say that there aren't organizations out there that have board members that have been on for 20 years. And, and the first thing we say when we do these institutes is if it ain't broken, don't fix it. If it ain't broken, don't fix it. But don't put in a policy that says you have to rotate off in six years and then not enforce it because you're setting yourself up for a lawsuit in that case. Uh, in terms of executive directors, there's no wisdom at all about when executive directors should be rotated out, but I can tell you again from recent research that was done nationally, 65% uh, of the nonprofit executive directors that took this survey, and it was a, a, a statistically valid cross-section, said they would not be in their job in five years. So you can expect a lot of turnover in the nonprofit field. Just we and we see that very typically. If I look, if I go back and I look at all my clients over the last five years, I can promise you that executive director turnover is going to be somewhere in that area over a five-year period. That second bullet: board seeking their own level. Uh, what that refers to very simply is, uh, if I go out and I try to recruit people, I'm going to only be able to reach people that operate on my plane. I could not go out and recruit the chief executive of a large corporation to come sit on my board because I don't run in their circles. Uh, and so what you have to do if you want to raise the level of your board very typically is get some outside help of people that function at a higher level to help you reach people at a higher level. Because we all run in a circle that is at a, is a, at a certain strata or among a certain group or type of people. So, you know, if we need a high-powered lawyer for our board and we have nobody on our board but people from, you know, the local neighborhood, it's going to be very difficult to go find that person without getting somebody who's interested in our organization to help us reach out. So uh, you need to understand if you want to build the level of your board that um, you're going to have to do it with, with some outside help. The lack of commitment, uh, again, this is a very difficult issue and we hear this all the time that our board is not committed. Well, very typically boards aren't committed because they don't understand what their purpose is. There's been no communication in terms of what the expectations are. Uh, you know, they come on the board, you know, well, you don't have to attend many meetings, we won't ask you to raise money, yada, yada, yada. Then they get in there and they're really not sure what they want to do and when you recruit people, they should understand before they come on the board exactly what the expectations are and we're going to share those with you momentarily and so on. Wrong people on the board. Uh, how many times we've seen people on boards that are just there because they're friends of, of somebody. In fact, one of the early institutes we did, and it might even have been the one that we did, the first one that we did out here, we used to have a rule at these institutes, an organization could not come unless they brought a board member. And the institute had started and I was sitting out the front desk and this guy showed up and he said, I'm here for the institute. And I said, what's the name of your organization? And he said, I'm a board member. And I needed the name of his organization so I could give him his name badge and everything. And I, and I said, no, I need the name of your organization. And he goes, um, num, 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 And the organization had called this guy up in the morning and said, we need a board member here. Can you come and pose as a board member? Because we wouldn't because we wouldn't let him stay back in those days. So I cut him a break and, and sent him in. So, you know, they're the wrong people. You know, this guy was on the board. He obviously wouldn't be the right people. We've hit that lack of strategic plan enough. Uh, board capabilities out of line with agency needs or agency vision or whatever the case may be. Uh, if you look at how organizations grow, very typically they're started in somebody's kitchen. I don't know where, Bart, where you started yours, probably in the kitchen, right? 
Hewlett Packard. Mr. Hewlett and Mr. Packard started that large company in the kitchen, Mr. Hewlett's house. They created this calculator. They went out and started to sell it. The business started to grow, and they moved from the kitchen to the garage. And from the kitchen to the garage, the next thing they had to do was incorporate. They incorporated, and they went out, and they had to have a board. And they recruited their friends, and the organization grew. Well, pretty soon, the organization's needs, and board needs in particular, outgrew their board, and they had to begin changing their board. Steve Jobs of, um, of Apple one point lost his job because the organization outgrew his ability to management, or at least in the perception of the board. And so you've got to keep your board capabilities and keep building your board in line with your organizational growth. The I really don't want it leadership. How many times we hear, well, I got the short straw and now I'm the chair of the board or I'm the head of this committee or that committee. Uh, it's a problem. And we see it a lot. And what you have to do is you have to continually be nurturing people to take on those leadership roles. And you have to run your board in such a way that it's not going to seem like an indomitable task to take on that leadership. And then obviously the diversity issue is, is always rearing its ugly head out there. Right before you zip on, so biggest board driven mistake of all is failure to recognize a nonprofit organization such as your organization is a business. So can you put that in terms that uh, resonate with somebody who doesn't care about being in business? <laughs> yeah, I think you can. And I think you have to put it in the terms of what are your obligations to your clients, the people you serve. And the, the more you act like a business and behave like a business and run your business like a business, the more people you're going to be able to touch. And if you have somebody on your board that hates business, then you're going to have to change your terminology because there are people okay. in the world that hate business. So are there, are, well, hate business is a little bit strong well, to use for some of us. But <laughs> anyway, the, the, there's like, do you have any other terminology that you, or, or is that just what you use because it's well, I would, if you, if you, if this is offensive or whatever, to recognize that a nonprofit organization has a distinct obligation to the people it serves. Okay. Yeah. You know, and to, Which is a little more vague, but yeah, it but, doesn't grab you. Okay, I'll, I'll I don't, keep working we'll, on we'll it. work on it when we have our, our free time. Mr. Bell? Yes. Um, I understand why diversity in a church gathering decision making capacity or in my neighborhood effort. But why is why is diversity necessarily on every kind of board? It probably is less so with your organizations than it would be for organizations that are out looking for institutional funding, <coughs> grants and so on, because those people do look at it. And those people are not faith-based in most cases. They're driven by a different set of, of values. Uh, but I would still say diversity in the sense of skills is critical. It's critical. Uh, age diversity probably is, uh, is, is something that you would want to consider. Uh, and not so much for getting older people on your board, but getting younger people. One of the mistakes we generally make is we go for the old guys like me, who I think are the worst board members in the world because we think we know it all, and, and, and avoid the young Turks like I see sitting out here, who really make great board members because they're willing to work and dig in. One harder show, I mean, I'm, again, I'm looking over and going like, most of the organiz many of the organizations in this room serve very, very poor constituencies. And their board meetings are consumed with fundraising and fund allocation. And I've sat in board meetings, which was very uncomfortable because the salaries that you were talking about or the money allocations you were talking about were way out of line <clears throat> with the, cons the constituents that were on the board. Yeah. So you're, and I'm just wondering, like, have you run into this problem before with people that serve the poor? Because in the end, most of the organizations that I've just worked for have decided not to have constituent representation on the board 
because it was just so awkward and uncomfortable. Well, you, there, there are ways to have constituent representation without having them on your fiduciary board. You can create a what we call a resource board or an advisory board and get your constituents on those boards or put them on committees even, on specific committees where you get their input if it's important to you, and in most cases 